Hi everyone, we are here with Jeremy Wade from Animal Planet's River Monsters. You appear to be at the National Aquarium in Baltimore. Jeremy has survived everything from uh, being shot at to being almost drowned, being uh, mistaken for a spy. And now I'm told you just survived yet another indignity. There are a lot of birds there at the aquarium too, aren't there? <laughs> Uh, that's absolutely true. New, news travels very fast. I, I, there's a little, there's a perch directly above me, and and this parrot was was sidling along it, and um, definitely had a, a glint in his eye. And uh, back of my shoulder, it wasn't. It could have been worse. It could have been my ear or something like that. But um, yeah. <laughs> Well, you've, you've certainly survived worse on your show. You know, for people who haven't seen the last four seasons, I, I don't know why they wouldn't. It's a great show. But you are a biologist and an extreme angler. Could you describe what might an extreme angler be for the folks at home that may not be familiar with river monsters? Um, what, I mean, with, with me, what happened was that I grew up in, in England, which... Um, there's a lot of people there in, in a fairly small space. There's not very much water. So that was what prompted me to, uh, to travel further afield. Um, and then once I started traveling, I, I, started, I started writing about what I was seeing. These are not creatures really that had been seen on television. Uh, people tend to be very familiar with what's in the sea uh, because seawater tends to be nice and clear. But most fresh water, apart from if you're in an aquarium and they put clean water in, you can't see what's there. Um, I was getting very surprised by what I was seeing and, and you know, wanting to, in some way, share that with other people. And you've been to some of the most remote rivers all over the world for 25 years now, and, and you've seen plenty of different kinds of animals. But my, I've seen your show, and sometimes it seems to dispel myths about certain animals, and other times it confirms them. Uh, uh, tell the folks a situation where you've come across an animal that uh, just wasn't what it was billed to be. Maybe not as bad as it was, or a whole lot worse. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, sometimes, um, you know, so sometimes the truth is every bit as dramatic as the myth. I mean, normally, everybody's used to the idea that you know, fishermen's tales, stories that people tell you, you know, there's bound to be a bit of exaggeration. Let's, you know, let's scale that back, and you know, the truth is going to be sort of somewhere, uh, you know, less dramatic than that. One very notorious one is, is in the Amazon. This concerns this, this parasitic fish that has uh, been said to swim up the urinary tract of, of people. And, um, but until fairly recently, I'd never actually met somebody that that had happened to. Um, you, know, you ask around, you know, the holy grail for me is getting an eyewitness or somebody it's actually happened to. And in that particular case, eventually I found somebody that this had happened to. Uh, even found the surgeon who had operated on him and, and actually found the fish as well in a, in a jar of alcohol. Um, this is a fish that normally parasitizes um, larger fish. It normally swims in the gill opening, uh, latches onto the gills um, where it, it, it actually bites into the, the membrane there, drinks blood and then falls off. But it, you know, it, can, it can be misled if it's getting a chemical stimulus from somewhere else, you know, somebody urinating in the water, that takes them somewhere else. Um, very painful for the person, but a you know, bad mistake for the fish as well, which tends to, to die in that situation, in fact. Yes, I, I saw that episode, and uh, it, it, let it be known, do not pee in the pool, folks, or rivers. That is a, it's a bad thing to do. Now, this season, season five, you're looking to take on the Loch Ness Monster, as well as possible mutant fish in the area of Chernobyl. Is, if you find Nessie, what do you think it is? I mean, I'm sure you've studied up on it. Do you think it's some kind of evolutionary throwback or some kind of uh, serpent or, or eel? What, what's your guess? I mean, the great thing about, about Loch Ness, it's, um, it's a very large body of water. It's very deep. Most fresh water isn't deep, but Loch Ness, it goes over 700 foot deep. So there is, you know, there is space there for people's imagination to run riot. And, and also the thing about a, a big body of water like that, you get the wind on the water, you get reflections. People will, will see things. There is a big sort of psychological element there. But I mean, what that's meant with Loch Ness is that, that you know, there's no end of theories. Um, and you know, one of the theories is it, you know, it, it's maybe something that is elsewhere extinct that has survived. You know, maybe it's some kind of you know, isolated population of something that's, that's followed its own evolutionary path. So my job there, as always, was really to navigate 
through all the you know, what people say, try and add some science into that as well. Look at it from a, um, a fairly cool-headed point of view. Questions like, is there enough food in there to even support a big creature? And then try and come out with some kind of answer or try and come out with something, uh, you know, a real creature that people can look at and then make their own mind up uh, about that. And we did come up with something at the end, something very large and dramatic rises to the surface on the end of my line and uh, I won't say any more at this stage but it was, um, it was quite a journey and, and uh, a very memorable uh, culmination to that. Exactly. Folks will have to check out season five to, to, to see what that is, as well as the possible mutant fish at Chernobyl, which I think is a pretty good cautionary tale for not messing with the environment too much. Well, yeah, I mean, Chernobyl as well. I mean, you know, that's not a place that I thought, uh, or the kind of place that I thought I'd end up fishing. I mean, how, how can it be possible that anything's alive in a place like that after a, an accident of that magnitude? But I saw a photograph of a fish that came from there that appeared to have an extra lower jaw. Um, and you know, people are always going to think, you know, mutants, what, you know, what horrendous looking things are there. And it's a difficult place to visit. It's still a, you know, a controlled zone. It's, it's even more difficult to go fishing there. Um, the only reason I was allowed to fish is because I was working in collaboration with a scientist who actually wanted a fish that, that he could study. Um, ideally something that was about 30 years old because in that case it would have been alive before the accident and it's almost like if you if you look at it at a cellular level almost like examining the you know the black box the flight recorder of an aircraft you know what, what what's the story of this fish how has it survived you know are they mutants what does that mean and and of course very important uh, you know more important even even more important now in the light of fukushima you know how can how can nature deal with something like that happening to their environment Check out Behind the Iron Curtain and to the bottom of the Loch Ness with Jeremy Wade on Animal Planet's River Monsters. Jeremy, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Rich. It's been a pleasure. And be careful out there. I always, well, so far, so good. There we go. Everything, everything's still there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again.